You describe the situation in Europe with austerity, with government's attempts to stimulate some sort of growth as a game of musical chairs. Why is that? Well, my view is that the fundamental problem is there was a lot of borrowing uh, and spending on stuff that wasn't investment. There was basically big parties. Okay? There was expenditure that wasn't going to be useful in terms of helping economies grow. And it's gone. Somebody's got to pay for it. So the question is really, at the end of the day, who bears the brunt of all that spending and all that debt? Is it the German taxpayers because Germany bails out Greece? Or is it the creditors of the major banks because the creditors are forced to take big haircuts? Is it the ECB, which has bought a lot of debt from Greece, Italy, Spain, and so on? But somebody's got to take a hit. And the reason it's taking so long and nobody wants to come to resolution is nobody wants to be the guy that takes the hit who ends up without a chair when the music stops. You say the Europeans are poorer than they think they are. Uh, and at the ballot box, you're allowed to express yourself as irrationally as possible, choosing your leaders. Right. Francois Hollande is right. now uh, the head of France. And now the first thing he announces after being elected is a lowering of the retirement age. Right. So. All the things that these governments are spending money on, a lot of people like them. Lots of people would like to be able to retire at an earlier age and have someone else help pay for it. They like the health insurance that's provided by government. They like all that other stuff. So when they go to the ballot box, a lot of voters are going to tend to vote in favor, even if they have some sense that it's not affordable long term because they don't necessarily think about the long term. They think about what's true for them in a few years or five years or 10 years. Um, but it's not sustainable, so it takes someone with a long horizon to say, OK, we have to start making cuts soon. Politicians also have a short horizon, so the politicians seem to always respond to what the voters want right away, rather than making the tough choices that look to the long term. A lot of people equate Greece leaving the euro as Greece defaulting on its debts. What is your take on that? So there actually are, those are two different things in principle. You could imagine that Greece says, we don't want to be part of the euro anymore. And the European, the European Union says, well, OK. And Greece then adopts a new currency. We'll call it the drachma. And one drachma is equal to sort of one euro. And so everything. But that's, of course, not the way it would work. So if Greece left the euro, the likelihood, based on all the fundamentals, is that the drachma would immediately depreciate enormously. It would trade at sort of 40 cents on the euro or something like that. So that would mean that the debts that Greece was repaying, where it was giving every one, drach one drachma for every euro it owed, would actually be only giving them back 40 percent. The people who had loaned to Greece, the creditors, would be taking a big haircut. So when people are worried about Greece leaving the euro, because they know that means, in effect, that Greece is going to significantly or at least substantially default on its existing debts. Well, what about this goal that is expressed broadly that the euro should survive? So to me, that's a completely insane goal. It should not be an independent goal because the euro never made sense in the first place. The euro was had a sort of plausible rationale. We don't want people to have to change currencies when they you know, go from one country to another. That would be a benefit. But of course, the world has dealt with multiple currencies for centuries. It's still dealing with it in most parts of the world, other than in the Eurozone. And it works OK. It just adds a little bit of friction, a little bit of transaction cost. But that's certainly manageable. But the main reason politicians pushed it is they wanted this united Europe. They wanted the political power they thought would come from having all those countries merge together. And Germany and France in particular felt that they could then be bigger deals on the world stage. But they didn't think forward enough to realize they were implicitly also taking on the debts and the excess spending of countries like Greece, Spain, et cetera. And now they're not so, it's not so clear. But at the end of the day, we don't have the euro. That by itself is OK. There was never a mechanism for exiting the euro. There was not a, a plan set out ex ante that if certain things occur, your participation in the euro will be at an end. You will need to set up a monetary authority again. Uh, the benefit, I would guess, of having all of these countries have having different currencies would be that failure would be more swift, or would, or protect you'd be protecting against failure. You'd be partially protecting against failure. You would also very generally be allowing for adjustments between one country and another. If the fortunes of one country really improve, that's going to imply a change in the relative price of that country's goods compared to other countries, and the exchange rate 
is what does that. Having prices be flexible very, very broadly is useful for clearing markets, for equilibrating, for sending signals about where there should be more demand and less demand and more supply, et cetera. An exchange rate is a perfect example of that. It's just the relative price of goods in different countries. The euro shuts that down. Fixed exchange rate mechanisms more generally prevent those sorts of fluctuations in the terms of trade across country. Those fluctuations are very valuable. Okay, to countries, not in a very short horizon. Uh, we're only talking about a week or a year. It would be OK. But over a decade, countries get out of whack. And so you need those exchange rates to adjust. There seems to be a disconnect here. And I'm not talking about having uh, an independent uh, monetary authority uh, versus having a politically controlled monetary authority. But there seems to be a disconnect between countries that are able to make all these political decisions themselves, that is fiscal policy decisions and things like that, but having a monetary authority that must account for the needs for many, many countries, diverse countries. Right. Is that a central problem here? That's a crucial part of the problem. So under the Eurozone, monetary policy has basically been set to be the, is setting to be the same across all the countries in the zone. So they all sort of have inflation go up or down with whatever the euro does. Each individual country can't depreciate or inflate or anything like that. At the same time, they've been allowed to choose whatever fiscal policies they want, and therefore to borrow huge amounts, okay, and uh, to set labor market policies individually so they can have very, very strong union protections. And that's made some countries incredibly uncompetitive in the European market, such as, such as Greece. And that's not a sustainable situation. So again, if prices were flexible across countries, if Greece had the drachma and France had the franc and Germany had the Deutschmark and so on, you would be able to see additional exports, additional industry wanting to locate in the really low-wage places like Greece, but that doesn't happen now because they're, they're tied to the euro.